Get ready to listen, learn, and earn CE hours. This podcast features content from an accredited CE activity provided by Calibri Healthcare. Visit EliteLearning.com slash podcasts for accreditation and disclosure statements and instructions on how you may be able to earn CE credits. Welcome back to the final episode in this series. In the previous episodes, we identified some of the contributing factors related to violence in the healthcare environment. Stay tuned as we continue the conversation with Gordon Gillespie, an expert in the subject. I want to talk a little bit about how we're managing this. I actually read an article recently. It was this week, and I think it was Chicago, Chicago UI, I believe it was that system, um, hired or made a role, let's say they, they have a role and they've, they've hired for that role. And it really is like a single designee, a person that's really in charge of, of strategizing workplace violence as far as how we manage that, how we mitigate that, you know, being that, that point of contact. I imagine not every single hospital will do the same exact thing, you know, for different reasons. But what are the ways that we are now and, you know, from your knowledge that we can in the future manage this? So I kind of like the idea of them having a single contact person, but I'm also a bit concerned about them having a single contact person. And and so part of it is I don't know enough about it. So the context of it is if you have one person and it becomes, oh, here comes Gordon talking about his one issue again, and how integrated are you? And that's your one thing. And if you also become the great expert, what happens if another institution that says, oh, wow, I just got this great person. I'm here at University of Cincinnati. Let's like recruit that person away. Then the way they do, who is left and what's the infrastructure? True. And so you just took all that brain trust and it got all got kind of sucked out. So I like the idea of having like, say, the czar, so to speak, yeah. who is the over person that knows all and they're the hub. And so if they leave, hopefully they've got a backup hub. But I, I prefer to be kind of integrated into a culture of safety where it's about, did someone give a wrong med? They have root cause analyses. They have a team of people that swat it all out and say, what can we do to make it better? They look at um, a medication dispensing system. When you go in and get a medicine out, you don't have the normal saline vial with the heparin sodium vial. You put them in different drawers. You label them differently. You have HEP and caps so that you do things to make it safer. That group looks at it. That group should also have on their standing agenda, medication errors, pharmacy errors, and incidents of workplace violence. So it becomes something that they always talk about. And it's not like, oh, well, since John's not here today, he's not coming to our meeting. We don't need to talk about this item. It's like, no, this is a standing item regardless who comes. And we can have someone from his committee come to us or we can go to them. But it becomes ingrained at the department or unit level so that we have a safety group at every level. And it's not, again, just about patient safety. It's about worker safety. And a sub of worker safety is workplace violence. And one of the projects I did, we ingrained it so that nurses, the charge nurses would do rounds every four hours. And there's already things that they do to check in and be like, how's the team working? How are you doing? Are there any kind of issues I need to be concerned about? And we put on their checklist and have there been any events of workplace violence? or anything of that nature. And then it was like, oh, well, yeah, actually there was. They're like, but you didn't tell me. Well, you know, we have other things to do <laughs> other yeah. than calling you. Like we're busy or it wasn't that bad. So we're okay. And it's like, okay, well, we need to know these things. And so by purposefully asking, then when that charge nurse at the end of the shift, they would then report off onto a safety line for the, um, it, was more, it wasn't necessarily like a safety line, but it was a line that they reported off to a central administration at the end of every eight hour shift. It was like, yeah, this is the emergency department. This is Gordon. I'm reporting on. And they had a checklist that this is the things that happened. This is how many people have been in restraints. This is how many people have been intubated. This is our time for admission to discharge for the, because it's the emergency department. So you provide yeah. additional details. And these are the events of violence or safety issues. So then it was like, okay, then that kind of gets forwarded to another layer that they can then be like, you know, it's just like three nights in a row that we've had significant events. Like what's going on? And that can then initiate a procedure that could be from the czar or another person to say, you know, I'm seeing now a trend, but I think having it ingrained to where it's multiple people's responsibility, not a single person. But again, IU might be doing that and I just don't know, but having it ingrained through multiple layers ensures that it becomes something that's always talked about. And because it's always talked about, you have to do something about it. 
Yeah. And that's the um, advantage of the general duty clause. I'm not sure. Are you familiar with that? No. So the general duty clause is um, part of the Occupational Safety and Health Act that was passed way, I think it was in the 70s. I don't know the exact date. But it, and that's where you have your bloodborne pathogen law is in the federal code. And then there's the um, part of the OSHA Act is that basically what it says is if we didn't talk about it in a specific act or there's a specific standard and you learn about it as an employer, you have an obligation to still do something about it. And if you think about latex allergies, latex didn't used to be a problem until it was. And nurses were experiencing latex in civil, in, um sensitivities, latex sensitivities. And like they take off their gloves, they're starting to get rashes and eventually it becomes worse and worse. And they said, you know, we need latex free gloves. Nope. Can't afford it. Ain't going to do it. It's not a requirement of the federal government. There's no standard. But what happened was nurses started filing suits saying under the general duty clause, we have now put you on notice that a problem exists. You've not done anything about it and you're now liable. And when those started happening in several states, then all of a sudden, hospitals realized they have an obligation now to move to a latex-free environment, and it eventually did become a standard. And now workplace violence is one of those. It's I think now through Joint Commission, they've got a standard Joint Commission. It's not yet a federal code or a federal requirement, okay. but Joint Commission is helping to move it in that direction. But as an employer, if you become aware of a trend or problems and you do nothing about it, you are going to end up being liable for the bad outcomes down the road because you chose to do nothing. Mm. And the perfect example is we were doing a workplace violence in implementation study um, back in the day. And one of the hospitals, we were told that after we started the study, they said, we just got notice from our corporate office. They're going to start closure procedures for us in two years. And it was like, okay, so first, the first thought is, selfish. What does this do for our research? Because we've got a federally funded research study. We're on a timeline. And it was like, well, it won't impact your research, but we're like the rest of the health system. They're getting new um, computer systems, new electronic health records. We're going to get none of that. And it's like, okay, well, that is your workflow, but we can still work around that. And as that facility started um, posting all of their reports for workplace violence, they went, and these numbers, I don't know the exact But say it was three events over a three-month period, then it became 40 events over a three-month period. That's a huge, and I see how your eyes, if you don't have camera, like it's like, whoa, (laughs) shocking. Yes. And so the good part was their risk manager saw that and had the same response. Whoa, something is happening. What is it? And so being a good steward for the organization, they actually called in people that were not our team, but a different set of external consultants who came in and said, you have a high-risk area. I'm surprised your rates weren't higher. And they were like, well, it's because they actually weren't reporting. Uh, The problem was there, but no one knew it. And so afterwards, they ended up getting um, locked doors for the emergency, the ambulance ambulance entrance. There was a little half wall right next to the main ED entrance. But patients parked and walked by the ambulance entrance to get into the main. And so people could come in the side door and be in and be infiltrating and causing harm, like say type one workplace violence. Or if you're looking for retribution, from last night's, you didn't get what you needed, you could have come in. So they ended up locking down the doors. They had a person in the lobby that sat on night shift by herself or himself in the lobby, the uh, registration personnel. So they finally put a camera so that the person in the back could watch that person. So that that person that had something happening, they could send a team out. And then probably the greatest thing they did was give a direct walkie-talkie to security. Because back in the day, they would say, we need security here stat. Well, can you tell me why? Because he's unlocking the door. He's got to get to cafeteria for a turkey sandwich. He's got to get in a pharmacy or he's on the parking lot. Well, we've got an assault going on. I said, well, is it that bad or can it be a few minutes? And so you're having a conversation in the middle of a workplace violent event where you should be helping. Right. But now they got a walkie talkie and went straight to security. And it was like, Joe, we need you here staff for violence. He goes, I'm on my way. And like, that's what they needed to hear. But those things, they couldn't do that. And I think they spent about 30 or so plus thousand dollars changing the structure, the environment to allow for the safety. But that was a direct relationship of reporting because the general duty clause, had they not done that, it could have been enacted. And so really that ju- general duty clause, thank goodness for that great risk manager who saw the data and said, we have to do something. Even though we're closing down this institution, let's hardwire in some changes to protect our workforce. 
Yeah, no kidding. So talk to me more about some of these other strategies. So something that I really love, and it was something I learned from Dr. Corey P.K. says she's from the University of Iowa, and she's now, I think, like either a VP for research or something, but she taught me a lot about walkthrough assessments. Okay. And it's really the kind of model that I looked at when we did one of ours. You get in a professional team, you want security, you want an administrator, you want somebody from the workforce, like say the nurse or somebody from the department, and you kind of walk through. And I always think about it when I did my walkthroughs for the EDs. So let's start from the patient's point of view. Let's get to the parking lot, get to the garage. Let's look around and let's see where they're at. Like, wait a second. I see workers parking next to patients. That's not good. You need separate parking structures, separate parking entrances. Otherwise, if Jana and you and I get into a fight in the ED and you're discharged, and now five minutes later, I'm walking to my car next to you. There might be a problem there, whether you're just going to key my car or you get into a fight with me, whatever. That's not really a safe. So you need to have separate parking areas. And then you kind of look at lighting. You want it to be bright as daylight at night. One of the facilities we went through, when you kind of looked at it, it was like, I can't imagine being a person that felt vulnerable and saying, I'm going to walk into that parking lot looking that dark. It's like, those are things you see on TV and you find out later the person was assaulted murdered, kidnapped. You're like, wow, why did they even go in there? Because they have to go home. They got to get to their car. So that was kind of an issue. And we talked about lighting. And then when you get into the building, you kind of walk through like, what would be the patient's experience? Are they received? Are they ignored? Are there things laying around? Um, One of the departments we went through, they sponsored a lot of sports teams, which that was really fabulous. All these, um, it was a local community hospital. There's actually no hospital attached. It was a freestanding emergency department. They had an outpatient overnight stay. So they had, it was like, it was more like you're going to be here overnight. If you had to stay, we would actually transport you to a a permanent hospital. Texas has lots of freestanding EDs. So it's a common thing. And in Ohio, they're becoming more and more common as well. But in it, part of that community outreach and having it develop with the community is you can sponsor events and sponsor sports teams, which is really nice because then you're more connected to your community. So that can help reduce the rate. So it's really great. But what they had was all these plaques for the sport teams were hung on the wall. And so I grabbed one and it comes off the wall. Well, wouldn't you love to have a five pound weight to throw at someone? And now you've got them on the wall. They're easily accessible. And it's one of those, it's great to have them, but bolt them in, screw them in. Don't just have them hanging on a hook. And that was one thing. And and this particular ED, all the main doors were all locked, which is really great. So it helped prevent access. So that if you need to control traffic flow or you need to keep certain people out for safety, like a partner or a domestic violence incident. But what they had was the registration desk had a door that they left open because they needed, they said for airflow. Mm. And behind that person was a door into the main ED. Well, now you've got every point is locked down except for that one. And then when that person was not the desk, it's basically leave your doors unlocked. Yeah. So that became a challenge in terms of how do you really manage and have the ability to lock down? For inpatient settings, it's really hard because at night shift, you can lock the front doors. And um, I'm a non-smoker, but I used to go out with the smoker sometimes on night shift. When we go to the front of the hospital, we realize if you took an ink pen with you, you could take it to the top of the door, the automatic doors, and push it through the little top where the rubber meets, and it'll trigger the door release. Oh, no. So the building is locked down, but you can get in. And because there's no one monitoring the door, are you really safe? And right. so if people think, you know, I can throw you out and I can say what I want to because we're going to make you leave, they actually can get back in. Yep. And all it takes is an ink pen, which is very, very minimal effort. And it took all about like two seconds. You reach up, push it in, and you're, the door's open. Because they're not, because you have to have them, the ability for emergency evacuation to get out, getting in, it takes a little effort or a little, you have to kind of know. But those are things that as you look at, do you have departments your fire doors, can your fire doors be locked, truly locked down in the event of an active shooter or in terms of violent event? Like you normally want them where you can open them, but is there a way to have some type of lockdown? What would that look like for an active shooter type of event? Yeah. And then, um, and so part of the walkthrough is you look at those things, you look at where things are hanging up and you also actually talk to people. So I go around and be like, Hey, Jenna, so how's it going? Oh, great, great, great. Well, right now we're doing a walkthrough focused on safety and mainly on workplace violence. Like, what are your thoughts about that? And it's kind of a really open-ended, it's like doing qualitative research, but it's very fast paced and impactful. And one thing we said with people is, um, if you could change anything, 
just ignore the cost because you know we got no money. We never do. But then again, we do when we really need it, right? Right. So regardless of that, what would you do differently? And then the other things are like, you know, that kill box out there, like when you got to walk in and one of the hospitals, and that's what we kind of called it, you, you were you walked in and you had to meet a person, but you could actually climb over the counter and the person couldn't go anywhere else, but you were in this like almost locked room and in getting into the building because they were always on this higher level security How and they call it the kill box is because it's like, and it was like, that's interesting. So we need a way for me to escape when I have to go out there and work at that desk and a way for that person not to be able to get to me. And so it was like, but we want to be customer oriented. We don't want to look like we're keeping people out. Good part of that is that that was pre-COVID. Post-COVID, everybody's got barriers up now. And right. so some of those, the barriers are there for um, droplet precautions, respiratory precautions, but there actually can be twofold. As long as it's made of um, either bulletproof glass or some kind of more plastic so you don't have to worry about shattered glass coming on you. It's actually a perfect way to focus on violence, but you can call it COVID, which can be more acceptable. So from a customer orientation point of view, COVID actually had a positive impact for physical structures. May not have been good for anything else, but at least for that one piece that it did. And as you talk with people, you learn about are there riskier areas? And we learn about rooms that they always put them down in this hallway, down on the very end, because we don't have to hear people yelling and screaming. But then again, the person that's the sitter is all the way down at the end of the hall where you can't hear anybody yelling and screaming for help. So it's one of those, oh, let's bring that loud, violent person right across from the nursing station, which is a distraction, but it also helps with the safety. And if you need a call for help, it's just help as opposed to screaming at the top of your lungs, hoping that the patient in the next room will say, there's somebody down here screaming <laughs> and you did somebody because I can't sleep. And that someone um, can run fast enough to get to you. <laughs> yeah. And that's something that people answer and they're not busy. And so they, there's the nice things about walkthroughs and something you kind of mentioned earlier, um, in terms of the worker, that they do have mental health disease and disorder. People have addictions themselves and they're trying to curb those and they can't always manage. And Or they've got life stressors that are beyond their control. And so something is proactively doing stress management training, really getting down. And again, assuming that every employee, if you have that perspective, has work-life events or home-life events that stress them. Let's educate you and prepare you for when something really bad happens. How do you handle it? And for me, probably because I'm a guy working in the ED setting for so long, I've been called so many things that after a while, you're just kind of like, that's kind of funny. And you shouldn't laugh, but I'm like, you actually think you're going to upset me with that. That's almost cute. (laughs) But, um, But in reality, it really is offensive. But there are two things that if you say to me, all of a sudden okay, I'm done. We're, we're going to do, I'm going to get back at you now. And I realized that I had to learn what my trigger response was. And it's yeah. really just those two things. And it's only happened a few times, but it was when I went through some stress management training, I was like, wow, when they talk about your trigger word, like those really are my trigger words. So I started to reflect and I'm like, for whatever, and it doesn't be like, probably if they said that to you, you'd be like, huh, Gordon, whatever. it's no big deal. Yeah. But for me, for whatever reason, that's my trigger. Yeah. And so once I learned that and when I hear it, I'm like, I'll be right back. I know what I need to do is I just need to leave. I can't stay and try. I, I need to immediately leave the room and say, I need somebody else really quick in room seven. I, I just need a minute. Yeah. Because sometimes like it's in the middle of somebody's doing something you can't really leave, but you got to. So somebody's got to go back in for safety unless I can just walk out and say, I'll be back in a few minutes. And then I just take my breather. I'm now prepared for this person. I can go back in. Or if I know this person has a history of violence, then I can go in knowing that prepare for battle, (sighs) get in my zone, get my mindfulness moment. And I can go in and then when they do it, it's annoying. It bothers me, but at least I can manage it. And so everybody going through some type of stress management training helps. And then like, it's not like hostage negotiation, but truly getting negotiation skills. And again, it's one of those, what is your goal? My goal is to get a lunch break at least half the time to go to the bathroom at some point in my shift to get off on time, not be thrown up on. And then of course to live. Yeah. And it's like just those natural things that most people would think Basics. you don't need to just get, but sometimes those things you have to actually be purposeful. And in order to have that, you know, think about like, what's it worth? And when you negotiate with folks, 
sometimes they have unru- they have wants and they have needs. In healthcare, people want lots and lots of things, but they need none of it. But they don't know why. And so you have to start to negotiate and say, I hear what you're really wanting. And instead of saying no, could we negotiate? So a person might say, I really would like to have something to drink. I need this. But if they're on an inpatient unit and they're not allowed to have anything to drink because they're having surgery, what do you do? And you, so you might say, what if I could get you a piece of gum? Because sometimes you just need something in your mouth and the gum can help stimulate some saliva, but you got to promise not to swallow it because you can't have even ice chips. So that might be a way to negotiate. How can we get the, the need met based on what you want? And sometimes it's not possible. And it might be, this is really rough. I understand this is a horrible situation. What can we do with you? What can you, can you manage like these three hours? And if after that, as soon as you can get up, we'll be able to give you this. Can you, can we do that? As opposed to, you can't have anything until after surgery, like there's no end. But if you can provide some end point, you can do some kind of negotiation. And the thing I've always learned is don't use the words no. Part of that's by watching movies and like hostage negotiation, never say no. <laughs> don't say however, try to use the word and all the time. And it's hard. And I had a stressful situation this morning at my workplace that I had to manage. And I had last week, we had a crisis at the university I had to manage, had parents calling me and they're upset. And it's one of those people hate to say, I'm sorry, because it makes it seem like you're a bad person. But in reality, it's one of the best things you can ever do is just say, I'm really sorry about the situation. I will do everything I can to help fix it. And if I'm not the person to do that, I will find the person or keep trying to just provide some information. And I think those negotiation skills help train you and prepare you. You're not always going to do it perfect and allowing yourself to fail at times is okay. Yeah. But trying to strive to be better, but really doing those. And then now there's a lot of people talking about mindfulness all the time now. And I've got this app on my phone for, um, for it's our health app for the university, trying to get our workforce to be healthier so that we use less insurance and all that stuff. And it, it asks you every day, like, have you had a, at least a five minute mindfulness moment? And for me personally, when people lead me through mindfulness exercises, it makes me incredibly hostile. <laughs> it's <laughs> the opposite. It's just, yeah. And part of it's because like I'm, I do have ADHD. I'm very hyper. I'm a lot slower than I was when I was in my twenties, but I'm still by a lot of people, I'm still really hyper and my mind's always racing and trying to talk me through it. It's like, that's stressful, but I've learned that being mindful doesn't have to be this purposeful pause at an organized plan approach. It can be when you're going to go when the mornings, I take my dog out for a walk. I know now I need to walk in a, by the river where there's, it's actually by a sewage plant, the which by the river, but they have a lot of greenery and trees by it. So it's actually pretty nice Fair. depending on if you're upwind or downwind that day. <laughs> but for me, it's actually really, really relaxing. And so that's part of my mindfulness is like really connecting with relaxing and kind of brushing off some stress so that I can start my work day. And I think there is a lot of merit to learning about mindfulness and what it means for you as an individual, whether or not you want to do it structured, but knowing that. And one of the things I think is really, really critical for people to get past an an injury, whether it's mental health injury or a physical health injury when it comes to violence, is what you do when you find out. Back when I was early in my practice, the first thing people will say is, what did you do? Because obviously it's your fault you got hit. It's your fault you got spat on. It's actually not, but that's the implication is when they say, what did you do? And so a better question is, how are you? Yeah. What can I do for you? You might have seen the whole thing and you're like, yeah, you actually pushed that person and they were trying to leave and you kept following them out. You actually did escalate it. And that person was trying to stop you as the employee actually created it, worsened it, and led up to the event that eventually resulted in you being hit. Yes, they did the act, but you did everything you could up to that. The first thing to say is, are you okay? Yeah. Look at their mental and physical health first. What can we do for you? And then later, let's talk about how we got to this point. What could you have done differently? What would you have liked to be done differently? And then you can say, Part of our what we looked at is that a lot of it seemed like it might have come for you, and maybe and like, can we talk about why maybe you acted with these behaviors? Because it's not about you as a person; it's all about the behaviors. 
And how can we change these behaviors? But starting with, are you okay? is number one most important thing because then they're being heard, then they're being cared for and valued. And that helps them to become, if it's a modifiable behavior, you can. If you come off attacking, you're never really going to get the whole picture in order to do anything better on the, the backside. Now, one of the things too, I, before we wrap, you know, I was thinking about all these different strategies to protect the employee, strategies that, that institutions can be using as well. And I'm, I know we, we talked about, you know, flagging that, talked about that safe distance. Now I'm going to practice to see how far exactly does my spit land and if I'm being safe or not yeah. <laughs> with patients. Um, you know, in that way, telling colleagues, you know, where you are, your point, you talked about, hey, if I shouldn't be with this patient, if this is not the, the right scenario, I need to take myself out of that. But there's an assessment I've not heard about. And I wonder if you can talk about that. And I might be saying it totally wrong. Is it Stampadar or something? That's, that's how I pronounce it. Okay. Um, well, yes. Then both and, it's, together. and the nice thing is it does not require RN licensure. Okay. It is not a formal assessment. It's um, it, I always think it's not like a screening tool. It's not meant to be predictive of workplace violence. It's more about, do you want to make it through the day? Got it. And if you see these behaviors, what would you do? And it's, this is part of that see something, say something. Ah. So the stamp at our letters, and I, I think the, the original was the Dr. Crilly, I believe out of Australia. Okay. They originally came up with stamp. And then they did a follow-up study and added the EDAR. And it stands for staring, tone and volume of voice. I believe it's aggression, mumbling, pacing, um, emotions, um, disease. Um, Might have been then like anxiety, I believe. And then resources. And mm. most of those are all about, you can look at a person. And the part I love about this is when we did some of this training at one of the hospital systems in a different state, the registration clerk, like we actually created a team. And when the person said, you know, I could have told you every single person that would be fine and I'm always right. And she, and this, and it was actually, this person was a guy and it was really impressive because he was very young. And of course, my first thought is, well, you're kind of just a kid. You're a registration person. What do you really know? But in reality, he was gifted. And it wasn't much he's gifted, but he just knows how to use his eyes and look. Yeah. And he would go, when you see the person in the lobby pacing back and forth like a caged lion, that's basically, that's, you know, it's anxiety symptoms, that's um, pacing, but two signs. And later when they go to the back, of course, they, they just escalate because their, their needs and wants are not being met. Yeah. And so as you look at a person and they're staring at you, people like want to say, go shut that door. They keep staring at me. What? what you're really doing is throwing a Band-Aid at a big gashing wound that's draining all the blood in their body and it's not going to work. And then the people that the tone of volume of voice, they're very loud and obnoxious or they're very kind of people say mousy. They're really quiet. You can't really hear them. That person, like the louder one, you kind of expect. The mousy, quiet one, you don't. That's the person that's going to truly explode mm-hmm. because they're bottling it all in. And at some point, it's just going to be eruptive. And mumbling is really also kind of hard. Um, like if they're mumbling, you can't really understand them. It's because what they're kind of doing, like my wife, she's always say like, are you murmuring again? She goes, <laughs> I'm sorry. Cause she'll come home from the end of the day. And she had a job that was really an unhealthy employment for her. And she was coming home and just reverberating her day and just recapturing and just like, blah, 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 just rehashing her conversations. Those persons are having a lot of negative talk and that can also become um, bad. And like part of that emotions, like, you know, if you're crying and upset, that's kind of a situational crisis. It could be mental health, disease or disorder. It could be any number of things, could be pain response. But that person, they're experiencing probably a situational crisis. And what they would normally do, they're not going to act as normal as always. And in terms of disease, it's a lot of things we always think about. Um, And then the resources is one that's really not the patient or the aggressor centric. It's really the environment. And so COVID, and of course, this brings up COVID again. A C word. Um, it, was, it was a problem before COVID, and it's just made, COVID has made those things worse. Yeah. And that's, we still have a nursing shortage. We've had it for, I don't know how, like a decade or something now, it seems. And the faculty shortage makes that nursing shortage even harder. But with that shortage, you might be working on a unit that you need to provide care. You don't want to say, it's not safe for me to come in. And then there's no one. So you go in being a dutiful nurse but you're working under resource and you don't have enough human resources to manage. 
And when you don't have those human resources, people's needs are not going to be met as timely as you would like had you had the resources. So if you've got this angry, volatile person, you might then take one of the employees and make them a sitter. When I have other people that may not be there for violence, but they're there for pain and they can't get an IV started because you need to hold her. So they're waiting longer and now they're becoming angry because their needs can't be met because you don't have the adequate number of resources. And so that's one of those that it really takes looking at when you have an event for a root cause analysis, not just why, like you can ask the, the, the people there, why do you think it happened? Well, they were in pain or I was in pain and you can ask patients, but it's all about that one-on-one, but you don't find out later on is, well, how many nurses were on the unit? What was the nurse to patient ratio? Were like, how were the timers for the whole unit being responded to? And then you realize that it really wasn't just you and me. It's really that there was an environment that created this situation for this to happen. In COVID, as people have become, like early on, if you were exposed, you had to be out of the workforce. If you had a community exposure or if you were ill, you had to be out. The guidelines are continually evolving with data, which is good. But if you're now, but there's just a higher incidence now of people becoming sick, and then they now have to be exiting the workplace for a few days until they're able to recover, but there's no one left to replace them. Yeah. So now we're just continually habitually working lots of places without adequate resources. Yeah. Gordon, this has been very informational and a little bit cathartic, to be quite honest, because coming into it, there's a there's a lot of like, <sighs> we're going to have the conversation about workplace violence again, and there might not be any solutions again, but I got to be honest, the strategies, even the research that you have pointed out that you've done, some of the risk factors I didn't even think about in these ways. And you're right. What comes with wisdom of age and experience and recognizing when you're in a situation or when you might be behaving in a way that's perpetuating something else, it's been super, super informational. Is there anything that you want to leave the audience with that we haven't spoken about any parting words. Um, so kind of just two, and I'll try to be more brief with these two, but one of those is um, asking people if they have weapons on them. Yeah. It's one of those that usually we always ask people um, what medical problems do you have? Do you have any allergies? And those become commonplace. And if we can become common and one of the institutions locally also says, do you have any diseases such as hepatitis or HIV? And then they say, the reason we ask this of everyone is because we want to keep you safe. There's things that we'll do differently for you and for us. If we know we can implement interventions faster for our workforce, and that'll just speed up time for them to prevent the from becoming infected. And we ask that for everyone. And we should also be doing that for workplace violence. Like, do you have any weapons about you and people that you would never expect, like the 70 to 75 year old older adult woman who came into one of the EDs and she pulled out a firearm and laid it on the table. Oh, and she goes, I just need this for safety. I carry it everywhere I go. And in Ohio, we, we had the right to conceal a care, a right to carry a concealed weapon. Now we don't have to have any special permission, any more license. We can just carry a lot of States have that. So it's one of those people might have weapons and it's better to secure those on the front end. And if you do implement that policy, be aware of whose job it is to handle that weapon. So for the facilities we train, the role is that you call security who is trained to handle a firearm and put it into a lockbox. And depending on local policy, they might have to go to the police station to get it. If they have a license to have it, then they'll get it back. Or if it's a, a knife or other kind of weapon people have pulled out. Some people pulled out things like canes and we go, no, sorry, you can keep that. <laughs> we don't consider that a true weapon that we're looking for. And then, but we'll give you like anything but a firearm back when you leave. Once you're outside the building, security will give it back. And you'd never want to say, oh, I'm great with firearms, because what if you inadvertently shot your registration person? They probably would not forgive you, for starters. Um, So that's an important piece. And then the other part is when people come in and you're doing your intake process, whether it's in the ED, it's in surgery, or you're in an inpatient setting, is have a frank conversation about safety. We are committed to keeping everyone safe, whether it's our patients, our visitors, our employees. So if you hear or see something that doesn't seem safe, such as if there's a negative or violent encounter or people are starting to yell and scream, or if you feel like your care is not, you're not being safe in the bed, let someone know. And that does two things. The first is that it puts them on alert that someone else may be watching you. So if you act out, there will be witnesses and people will become come to help. So you won't be able to get away with it easily. So that makes them think twice about negative behaviors. And the second is, if it does happen, there's someone else there to call for help for you. 
And it kind of creates this environment. And then again, doing it for everyone, it's not about you look like you might be violent. It's more about everyone. Yes, you're only five and six and you're the parents or you're 75 and you seem normal, but it's about everyone. And then the other part is that when people do have violence, we kind of talked about how to communicate initially. There is a thing called diffusing intervention, which it is a formal process that happens at the end of a shift. And it's, it's optimal to be at the end of the shift. But the most important part about that is to make sure the person has the right to say no. And that it's like, it's similar to critical incident stress debriefing, which tends to happen three days later. And that's really built on the model of um, people who work 24 on 48 hours off, like firefighters and EMS, they might work a 24 hour shift. They come back three days later. And that's where the idea of the CISD would be 72 hours later, because it comes back when they are all back on shift. Healthcare is very different. We don't all work the same days together. Like we're not rotation A, rotation B, rotation C. You might work with a person three weeks later, like, oh, I haven't seen you in forever. How are you doing? (laughs) Like, you know, like you may not even, like it just happens. But the important part about that, especially since it's the same shift, is to say, Jana, it's okay if you say no. Because to force someone into mental health kind of counseling, if they're not ready for it, that can actually cause more harm than good. And so, and then the, probably my last big take home is report, 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 report. If somebody is just saying something to you and it's like no big deal in terms of like, they call me some stupid words and I'm like, you know, it's a dime a dozen. But if it ever feels threatening, if it feels like, you know, the way they said it, like, Hey, I will see you later. They didn't actually threaten me, but it felt threatening. It didn't feel good. Report those and report all assaults, even if it's a bite or slap from a confused person, because as those get noted, we can provide more FTEs to that department. We can provide more other safe handling techniques to prevent those from occurring, but only with really good data. And the more data we have, the better we can prevent injury and any kind of permanent dysfunction within the workforce. Absolutely. Report, report, report. We want to reinforce the just culture that we're all talking about, right, in the workplace and practice, right? I think we talked a little bit about that, but those drills, absolutely. Yeah, that would be my last kind of part in here. I found that super helpful when I was working bedside in the clinical space in hospitals, the different types of drills to prepare. It made me feel like at least I've got confidence that we have a plan here in case something happens. Yeah. And something with those drills is do a drill with the visitor who's the violent person. And I did do drills at one of our hospitals and the patient, when they did pretty good, everybody knew what to do. But when it became the visitor, it was what we call security. And I said, well, security is not coming yet. And when we did it, we actually did it as a live drill Mm. and security didn't respond. Oh, So we identified a failure in the system that particular day. But until they're here, what are you going to do? Right. We're going to call security. And we actually had paid professional actors, a a person that was representing an 18, 19 year old in the emergency department, and then adult, a parent, and the team did not know how to handle the parent. They didn't know what they were to do. And so doing the drills is really crucial because you can find um, threats to the system, faults in the system, what we call as root, uh, not root, uh, failure modes affect analysis. And so you look for failure modes and it's just, it's like a a term like in manufacturing, but we use it in healthcare. So you find out what the system's supposed to do and then find those failures. You can then fix them later. Yeah. But do it not just with patients, but have some drills with visitors as well. That's smart. That's really smart. Gordon, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for all of this dialogue and conversation. And thanks to everybody who tuned in and is listening. We hope you find this very helpful and that you join us again for another episode. This is Jana Emil for Elite Learning. This podcast featured content from an accredited CE activity provided by Calibri Healthcare. Visit EliteLearning.com slash podcasts for accreditation and disclosure statements and instructions on how you may be able to earn CE credits. Take your learning to the next level by subscribing to more podcasts on compelling healthcare topics.